The first mistake I made in my marriage was questioning my wife's devotion to Taylor Swift. <laughs> we weren't actually married at the time, but I'm choosing to take responsibility for it now like a good husband should. It was on a midday drive during our first few months of dating. We were both still sizing each other up, examining our interests, and I noticed she listened to Taylor Swift a lot. Sarah had commandeered the Bluetooth in my car and put on, I did something bad. And as the weird electro pop anthem played, I asked her, why Taylor? Why Taylor all the time? Her lyrics speak to me, she said. Really? Taylor Swift has good lyrics? Yes, she does. But all she writes are breakup songs. Pop songs about celebrities she dumped, or sad songs about celebrities who dumped her. Sarah sunk into the front seat of my car and was quiet for the rest of the drive. I had fucked up. <laughs> it was awfully rich of me to doubt Taylor Swift's artfulness. In my 20s, I listened to several terrible bands, including but not limited to Creed, Nickelback, and Fuel, I would name more, but three seems like a nice small number. <laughs> I think men like me embark on a typical musical journey. We play around with alternative radio buzz like Third Eye Blind, <laughs> dabble in punk rock territory with Blink-182, feel misunderstood with Linkin Park, get intimidated by everyone who likes hip hop, finally feel respected by the Black Keys, and then marry a woman who turns you into a Taylor Swift fan. <laughs> Sarah did give my musical preferences a fair shot. While cooking dinner one day, I put on the Mountain Goats. She, she listened quietly to John Darnell's warbling while mincing garlic. I could tell she had thoughts. <laughs> Do you not like it? I asked. Not really, she said. Why not? He sounds like... Then she trailed off and took her time composing the rest of the sentence. Oh, this should be good. <laughs> he sounds like a Barnes & Noble employee who tries to recommend Sylvia Plath when all you want is the latest vampire novel. <laughs> I deserved that. Women sometimes forget. Swifties never do. A more vindictive woman would have dumped me on the spot. But Sarah played the long game. She understood a natural law. If you spend enough time in the company of beautiful things, you will see that they are, in fact, beautiful. The more I liked Sarah, the more I liked Taylor, to the point where we eventually had a real conversation about her. You know, the one where I wasn't an asshole. Sarah taught me that Taylor Swift writes far more than just breakup songs. Her music covers the entire spectrum of what it's like to be a young girl who grows into womanhood. No wonder I didn't pick up on it. <laughs> That's the kind of revelation men don't arrive at without help. I started to listen to the music under the music. Her lyrics were punchy maybe even a little bit clever. And soon I was choosing to send Taylor Swift over the Bluetooth airwaves as I cooked dinner with the woman I realized I was going to marry someday. One afternoon I heard a scream. It was a scream that activated something primal in me. Must defend woman in danger. <laughs> I bolted out of the office, ready to defeat either someone who was trying to break into our house or a spider that was lurking in the corner. It wasn't that kind of scream. It was just Sarah on Instagram. Taylor is releasing a 10 minute version of All Too Well. <laughs> the adrenaline in my veins slowed to a trickle. Ah yes, All Too Well. The song allegedly, but also totally verified about Taylor's relationship with Jake Gyllenhaal, the actor who stole her, her innocence and broke her heart. Breakup songs don't get more breakup-y than All Too Well, and it was about to get 50% longer. But damn, when that 10 minute music video debuted, I cried right alongside Sarah <laughs> as we sat on the couch holding each other together as her lyrics took us apart piece by piece. My transformation was complete. I had become a Swifty. 
Me, of all people, a man who mostly listens to stoner rock, even though I don't smoke weed, and psychedelic rock, even though mushrooms terrify me. This... <laughs> this was new. The last time a woman challenged my views this hard was when an ex in my 20s made it clear I had to believe in God if I ever wanted to see her naked again. But there was nothing conditional about this. I just loved that she loved something. Sarah liked Taylor Swift so much and with such a transparent, honest passion, I became a fan of the music as easily as I became a fan of her. Seeing how much devotion she had to something which brought her so much joy, it was like I could see every promise her heart would make. To me, to a future, to a marriage. Beautiful and bursting with joy, Sarah walked down the aisle to Taylor Swift. <laughs> Our first dance was to Taylor Swift. We have had sex to Taylor Swift. Sometimes I feel like we're having sex with Taylor Swift. Which is the closest either of us will ever come to knowing what it's like to play in the NFL. <laughs> Do you remember when Folklore came out? Sarah asked from the passenger seat of my car. We were 40 miles outside LA and just a few hours from seeing her personal goddess live in concert at the Eras Tour. We had been married for about a month. I did remember Folklore. In the summer of 2020, that album was a welcome respite from the days of COVID-19 and either way too much alcohol or not nearly enough. We'd both pour ourselves a drink and get to work cooking a HelloFresh meal while Taylor Swift's iridescent ballads played as the world outside our kitchen burned. Lockdown neutralized many relationships, but for Sarah and I, the dystopian anomaly seemed to draw us closer together. I concentrated on the road. I'd driven to Los Angeles countless times, but this drive was challenging. Maybe it was because right after we passed Irvine, I had developed a searing headache. It pulsed behind my eyes, and I squinted at the road, trying to concentrate. Are you all right? She asked. Yeah. You look a little tired. I had successfully dodged COVID for three years. I certainly wasn't about to get it before a Taylor Swift concert. I would be fine getting it at the concert because at least then I could claim that I got it from Taylor Swift. <laughs> Just didn't sleep well, I said. But I was definitely sick with something and hiding it as best I could because the destructively imaginative part of my brain convinced me that I would put some kind of black mark on the marriage if I didn't just stick with it. Rule number one in the manual for how to be married to a Swifty had to have been don't drive in the opposite direction of Taylor Swift. So I kept driving. We turned into the parking lot of SoFi Stadium, the 70,000 seat Pantheon and future home with the 2028 Olympics. Fans streamed toward the building wearing dresses and boots and hats, glittering and giddy. And I felt like a tourist, an anthropological researcher among the tribe of Swifties learning their ways. A pregnant woman wore a dress with future Swifty printed over her baby bump. <laughs> Men wore t-shirts that said, I'm the husband, it's me, or dads are Swifties too. <laughs> One man wore a shirt with a screenshot of a Kanye West tweet that read, I'm sorry, Taylor. <laughs> Sarah squeezed my hand in a rare way. When she's especially excited, especially in love with me and happy to be alive, she crushes my metacarpals in a hurt-so-good kind of way. <laughs> my headache seemed to dissipate for a moment. Our marriage was going to be fine. I willed my blood cells to behave as we approached showtime. If I just kept my eyes open and stayed hydrated with my $12 bottle of water, I'd make it through this. <laughs> we would make it through this. Seated in the upper tier, we waited for Taylor's light to bless us. Sarah was wearing a dress prettier than anything she'd ever worn on a date night with me. <laughs> we were minutes away. The air felt electric as SoFi Stadium grew more fired up than it had for any single football team that had ever played there. <laughs> then, it happened. Rising up on a platform, birthed from billowing crests of color-shifting waves as if from a chrysalis, emerged Taylor Swift. 
Five feet, eleven inches of fame and beauty, sparkling and golden and perfect. A mischievous red lipstick smile with a touch of, oh, you're all here to see me? The stadium exploded into undulating bands of light that rippled around the upper and lower tiers. Everyone was clapping and crying. Sarah screamed. I screamed. My sore throat reminded me that screaming was a bad idea, and I told my throat to shut up. (laughs) Damn, this woman could rock. The concrete under my feet thrummed with energy as she played. For a moment, it felt like the power of the show neutralized the virus in my system. Taylor Swift is a kind of musical vaccine but the virus wasn't going anywhere. And Sarah didn't have a clue. What she doesn't know can't hurt her, I reasoned. Isn't that a standard trope in marriage? Omitting certain details in the spirit of marital harmony? Examples might include not telling your spouse certain opinions you have about their family, or not divulging the full cost of a brand new 65 inch TV. Isn't that why older guys use that phrase, happy wife, happy happy wife, happy life? It's the kind of wisdom that resonates with Generation X men and older, loaded with the suggestion that wives are like captive jungle cats, and husbands are zookeepers who need to keep them fed and entertained so they don't maul anyone. (laughs) My father-in-law lives by happy wife, happy life. And as Taylor's grandiose, dreamy lyrics sloshed around in my brain, I thought of how epic it was that he'd been married for over 30 years just by sticking to that code. Taylor moved into the second hour of her concert, and I resisted every urge to ask Sarah if we could leave. It would break something, I thought. She'd get upset. She would no longer be a happy wife, and I would be a failure as a husband. She'd divorce me, and then, damn it, I'd have to write a breakup song. And because I'm competitive, I would want it to be a better breakup song than her breakup song. But there's no winning that contest. Both our breakup songs would suck because the only person who knows how to write a good breakup song is Taylor Swift. But none of that was even remotely true. In reality, if I interrupted her singing and swooning and shimmering and told her, babe, I think I might have COVID, She'd take my hand and march me right out of the stadium while the lyrics of Don't Blame Me faded into the distance. She'd drive us straight home, cover me up with a blanket, and not think twice about forfeiting two $400 tickets. She's that nice. Just one more hour, I thought. You can do it. Sarah hadn't sat down once during the entire show. No one sits for Taylor. Sure, the concert is over three hours long, but what's expected of you during that time? All you have to do is listen. Whereas Taylor sings and dances to 44 songs, wears 16 different outfits, and covers nine different eras of her music. The least you can do is stand at attention for that woman. But I wasn't so much standing as I was swaying and not to the mellow synths and shuddering drums of my tears ricochet. Sarah put her hand on my shoulder and looked at me. Are you okay? She asked. Don't sit down. I thought, don't sit down, you're fine. I shook my head no. I sat down, and she did too. I leaned over and I said, I feel terrible. Me too, she said. Wait, what? I have a headache. I took a closer look at her. Her usually clear blue eyes had lost their gleam and faded to a dull gray. I'd seen that look before, a year ago when she had COVID. (laughs) Taylor moved on to shake it off and my wife and I politely told her no. (laughs) We wouldn't shake this off, not for another week at least. She rested on my shoulder, and I rested on her head. Taylor moved on to Wildest Dreams, then Bad Blood, then Mirabal. Then we heard the opening notes of Karma. I fucking love that song. (laughs) We stood up and sang as loudly as we could. Thank you. Brett Hanafee, ladies and gentlemen. Brett Hanafee.